Biodiversity Conservation Foundation is an NGO based on Tamil Nadu with the vision to visualize a society for promoting and assisting in healthy coexistence of human and wildlife and ultimately ensuring conservation of biodiversity. Strategic implementation of this mission drives us to handle research and reaching stakeholders in a very synchronized manner. Our research extends from ants to elephants and exploring effective management practices in the perspective of biodiversity conservation. With our wide research team, we were able to work from Nagapatnam to Valley of Flas, stretching across different landscapes and different people with very dependency on the ecosystem. In a nutshell, we connect nature with people and people with nature. So let's get connected today also in the virtual platform to experience nature in an enhanced dimension. I am glad to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Matthew Spaffala, an aspire researcher in the School of Biological Sciences, University of Nairobi. His successful career in the field of conservation started with his bachelor's degree in environmental conservation and natural resource management. His strategic thinking ability drove him to work across fields including business development, administration and research related to water sanitation, marine biodiversity conservation, and fisheries management. To add to his contributions, he has made his impact on project management and evaluation in several organizations, including World Vision Kenya, National Environment Management Authority, and Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary. He has extended his research experience in wide dimension to enhance resource mobilization towards better conservation and sustainable practices. Once again, I welcome you to today's webinar. Now the mic is yours. Uh, hi everyone. It's actually afternoon here back in Nairobi. I know you guys are two hours, two and a half hours ahead. And uh, today I'll go straight to the point whereby I will present something to do with benthic ecosystem, but I will concentrate more on uh, the benthic fauna and specifically the male fauna. But uh, before we get there, I will I would like to introduce uh, uh, to, intro to, to, to introduce uh, what this benthic ecosystem is and. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this research actually was conducted in, uh, in 2013, whereby I just came to build up on the work that had already been done because uh, they were working on male fauna on general as bioindicators of uh, sediment uh, disturbance. But I'll first like to give credit to uh, my supervisor, that is uh, Professor Agnes Mudombe, who is currently at uh, University of Nairobi. And then my colleagues uh, Said Hashim and uh, Jesse Kangari, who assisted uh, in the uh, collection of the data. So if I go straight to the point, uh, what is a what is a benthic what is benthic ecosystem? Um, we find that these are uh, the benthic ecosystem actually it's right underneath uh, the water column, immediately uh, after the water column. I, I don't know if you can see this. This is all the way from the subtidal zone down to the abyssal zone. This zone here is what we term as uh, as, uh, as as the benthic ecosystem. Some some people will not, or rather, will say that it's a it's actually a dry land or a desert, but technically, it's not true. It's not true. It is really it has a lot of uh, diversity of animals and uh, marine uh, marine fauna. So we and as as I have said, it harbors different uh, benthic communities, which include the benthic flora. And this benthic flora actually is the seagrass, the mango, the kelp. That is where they grow. And then we also have the benthic fauna, which also I referred as uh, the endofauna. And we find that the endofauna is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is divided into two, but we will get there in a, in a short while. So for now, just on an overview of uh, the benthic flora, I concentrated more on the seagrass because um, 
I can say not much of, of research has been done to show the importance of the seagrass. Most of the research actually, the researchers concentrate either on uh, the mangrove because also of their ecological imp importance through, uh, through, through the marine ecosystem. So when we look at the seagrass, we see that there, we, all, we have four families and these four families have different genera, and they have species of up to 60, uh, they, they, they have about 60 species of uh, seagrasses. And we can see that they are uh, concentrated on the, on the Indian Ocean and uh, on the Pacific Ocean. And uh, that is subject also to, to discussion and also research to understand the ecology and, uh, and how and why they are, they are concentrated on this region. And we find that uh, they are, we find the, 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 the seagrasses in all the continent except, uh, except the Antarctica. So when you look at the first family, we have the, 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 the Zosteresee, which has two genera that are indicated here. I'm, I'm sure you can see them. And then we have the Hydro Charitasi, which is, uh, has uh, different genera, about uh, three genera, which is the uh, Enhalus, the Halophila, and the Thalassia. Then we have the Posidon, Posidona C, which has the uh, Posidonia, and then Simoda CC, which has these uh, hard names to uh, to pronounce, but I'm sure you can see it. And it's important to note that uh, the Haladule genera is only found in Taiwan, the Philippines, and uh, the, the South Japan. Uh, uh, so. As, we, as I, I told you, we have over 60 species of seagrasses, and uh, these are just some of the, of the species that I highlighted, including the Zostera marina, which is actually the most common and the most diverse uh, 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 seagrass we find. We, have, we also have the Enhalus uh, acoraides, and then the Halodule uninavis. Uni, uni so, we can look at uh, these characteristics of these seagrasses. Uh, when you look at uh, seagrass, um, some people even will fail to notice them, but when you look at them, they are always green. This means they possess uh, the chloroplast, the chloroplast, and that means they are able to tap into the sun energy so that they can uh, carry out photosynthesis. And then we see that they, they possess the leaves, they possess the roots, they possess the vascular bundles, and uh, just like uh, uh, like the terrestrial plants, and they also they have the rhizomes and the seeds. This is purposely for propagation. And also another character, an important characteristic of uh, the seagrass is that uh, we find that they are the primary producers in uh, in the benthic ecosystem. Despite having also, we, we know other organisms will get their their energy either from chemicals or. Or, or, or organic matter, but majority of the marine animals will depend on uh, on, the, on, on, on these seagrasses. And uh, just to mention, when we say chemicals, we find that also there is another zone in the ocean that is termed as as uh, the, the the hydrothermal vent. This is a very unique um, unique unique ecosystem also on its own uh, because one, it is found mostly in the deep sea. And you know, the deep sea has a unique characteristic when it comes to pressure, temperature, and also the food that they get. So these, you find these organisms in the hydrothermal vents have, have managed to adapt in this, uh, in this area. Another characteristic of these seagrass is that uh, they pro propagate either sexually or uh, asexually. And when we say sexually, uh, like, like for example, like the Zostera marina, they, they bear seeds and uh, they use the water as, uh, as the main uh, 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 form of transporting of, uh, or rather the form of transportation of these seeds. And when you talk about asexual, they, they develop rhizomes. Uh, these uh, rhizomes is whereby the buds and the young ones will shoot up uh, out from them, just like some of the terrestrial grass that we know. So <clears throat> let us look at uh, the ecological importance of uh, these seagrasses. Um, you find that uh, when, when seagrass develop in an area, they actually modify the area into a very unique habitat. And uh, you find that most uh, marine organisms will start coming uh, come, come to colonize this area. And once we find that the, there is a primary producer, which is the 
seagrasses, we have the, the secondary, uh, we have the consumers. You know, it will attract other other, other 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 marine organisms in the food chain, whereby we'll have a very unique and pristine uh, pristine ecosystem. You find that this is a, a squid that has just around uh, the, the seagrass, and when you see a squid, you can either get other organisms that uh, that come to just uh, seek refuge in this uh, in this region. Also, we had uh, we had noted that the seagrasses are, um, are are photosynthetic, so it means that they use the 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 the, 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 the carbon four oxide uh, that exists uh, in producing their own food. And when 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 they take in the carbon four oxide, uh, it means they, are, they, they 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 remove oxygen as um, as as a byproduct. And we know what oxygen does to all living things, be it the marine and the terrestrial, even the human beings. So that, that, that is how we consider the ocean, the, the marine, uh, or rather the seagrasses as, uh, as lungs of the ocean, as, uh, as, as opposed to where they are. Then we see that also they play another key role in sediment stabilization. Uh, just an example, when we look at the roots of, uh, of this uh, thalassia, it's actually thalassia, the roots, this, at the end of the day, this is what you come and see, uh, or rather they, when they grow, this is what uh, that comes up. And you see they are, they are well connected and, and they, 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 will, they will reduce, if not completely stop the sedimentation or rather the erosion of the sediments in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the ocean, either by the action, the wave action or the, the, the tides that come in, in an area, the, and stuff like that. So that is why we also consider it as a, as a very uh, important uh, role when it comes to, to sediment uh, stabilization in the ocean. And you know, when there's sediment stabilization also, it also promotes other small, small, small animals uh, to come in and uh, also harbor in because also they have the security. I don't know if we are together, I hope we are together. So, we see also the seagrasses. Uh, they form a very nice nesting and uh, and uh, a habitat area for several marine uh, the marine creatures, uh, such as the crustaceans. And the crustaceans, we when you go to the seagrass, you'll find a lot of copepods. You'll find a lot of astrocods, small fish that uh, that come to feed and uh, and they were that they, 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 the parents came and uh, rather the the adults came and, uh, and and laid the eggs there. So that's how they are coming up. And also juveniles of other of different uh, marine uh, organisms and uh, also we see that uh, these seagrasses they support a lot of uh, uh, commercial fisheries because this is where they come to feeding uh, for example the flat fishes the flat fishes are pretty important when it comes to commercial uh, commercial fish fishing so uh, another point is that um, on an on a 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 uh, these uh, seagrasses also play an important role when it comes to, uh, from, or rather, manufacture of fertilizers that are used in the terrestrial, uh, the terrestrial uh, uh, region. Also, we see that in other regions they use the seagrasses, such as the thalassia, to insulate their houses. And uh, by me saying ins in insulate their houses is where by they put them like in cold regions. You find that their walls are really they are insulated with these seagrasses, and also weaving baskets. And then also uh, they use it to touch to, to touch their houses, and then make bandages, and also very important factor when it comes to filling in the mattresses, but which are quite expensive in the market. And that is also gives us another reason as to why it is important to, 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 to rather protect the citruses because of their economic value to the humans. And also making of the cassettes, uh, some of the cassettes that we have, we have like uh, something like uh, the Range Rover, I discovered it, it has some, some seagrass in, uh, in the, in the, in the seat, so pretty important. When you look at uh, factors that affect uh, seagrasses, that is the major threat to, to this uh, seagrass ecosystem, we see the climate change. Uh, climate change comes in with its own effects, especially in the acidif acidification of, uh, of, 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 of oceans and stuff like that. So we see that um, the, the, the ocean, once the, the 
uh, it's, it's, I mean, rather clim climate, uh, when we talk about climate change, it means there's the release of the CFCs uh, gases into, into the atmosphere with which all this settles in the ocean. Now, when this, when this uh, 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 gases settle in the ocean, they are converted in, into, uh, into acid because there is a water component and, they, and then there is the, 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 the gas component that they combine to form an, uh, an acidic uh, solution, which in turn lowers the pH of these, uh, of these oceans. So we see that by, the, by, by so doing, um, uh, there is, uh, they, we have the animals that are, or rather most of major, major, uh, the major crustaceans in, uh, in the oceans that depend on the seagrass are coated with a calcareous uh, shell. And uh, this in turn will affect, uh, will affect their, 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 their eating habitats or rather their ecological uh, uh, importance in the seagrasses that provide an ecological balance. So we see that the seagrass at the end of the day, they may shoot up and you know when there's a, there's, there's, they, there is a surge in the population of the seagrass also with, that is not uh, in check or rather that is not being checked with the, uh, the, the, the consumers. We find that uh, this will lead to their depletion. Another thing that has proven to be a, a major threat in the seagrass is pollution. And uh, we concentrate on the plastics. Plastic has been on an increase throughout uh, actually uh, worldwide. And also, this also, you, we know plastic is more of a non-biodegradable. So you can guess what it means when it uh, goes to the, to the seagrasses and, uh, and, and other organisms. Also, we have uh, the oil pollution, like the, the recently oil uh, diesel pollution that happened in, the, in, the Russia, uh, in, in, in Russia. Um, we see that this oil most likely, or rather, will always uh, come and, co and coat and form a very a bad coating in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the seagrasses, uh, whereby the, 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 the stomatas are, are will be completely obs obscured. So the, the, the gaseous exchange will not be there. And this was, will, has proven to be a very big challenge when, when it comes to, to, to the seagrasses. Also, we see that uh, the excessive uh, use of, uh, of fertilizers, different regions, especially these developing countries, we still uh, we still uh, uh, depending on uh, on fertilizers, nitrogen and uh, nitrogenous fertilizers. And you know, when this uh, nitrogen goes into the water, it actually becomes a, a, a limiting nutrient. So it means there is going to be surge of uh, of, 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 of these seagrasses. So once there's the surge, it means there's also going to be a lot of organic matter being formed in, um, in, this, um, in the seagrass ecosystem. And you know, once organic matter is formed already, it means the condition in the area becomes, or rather forms a hypoxic uh, condition. And these at the end of the day will also uh, be a threat to these seagrasses. We also see the diseases. We have several diseases that affect these seagrasses, and uh, the most common uh, seagrass that has been affected by such diseases is the, is the Zostera marina, and this is brought about mostly by by, by shipping com companies, whereby they the use of the ballast water. So they go to this region, carry or uh, the ballast uh, uh, the ballast water that they, that comes into the ship is infected with such diseases, then is transported to other areas. Also, we see that uh, overfishing and also uh, bad fishing are habits. When you talk about overfishing, we know that several fisheries have, have collapsed due to overfishing. And uh, since we see that uh, fish depend on seagrasses for their habitat and nesting, there is going to be an ecological imbalance. At the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the ecosystem will not sustain itself. So the seagrass will, will, uh, will die which proves to be a, a major threat in, uh, in this, in this uh, seagrass ecosystem. When you talk about the bad fishing uh, practices, we see that uh, I can give an example of bottom trolling. Bottom trolling has always been an issue when it comes to fin uh, fishing. And it means, uh, if you can see from, from this, this is uh, bottom trolling. The net, uh, there's a boat that is trolling uh, uh, the net and this net mostly it's usually attached at the bottom of this net is attached with a with a chain, if not a scraper. 
so that it goes collecting all the, bo the, the, the bottom fauna that can be used as a delicacy and also for the economic value of, uh, of human beings. By so doing, you can imagine the impact and uh, it causes to these seagrasses. One, the disintegration of the ecosystem, the, the cutting of these seagrasses, approaching of the seagrasses, and that it has proven to be a very big challenge uh, to this uh, seagrass ecosystem. So we, I can, I will just highlight a few uh, uh, things about how we can uh, we can conserve these seagrasses. One, the most uh, common one is limiting or rather stopping uh, these uh, damaging fishing practices or habitats like bottom trawling. And how do we limit? We can come up with policies that that, uh, that guide people on how to fish. Uh, uh, or rather using better fishing and and, eco and seagrass friendly uh, fishing practices. And uh, these, sometimes this one gets uh, really hard to implement, but uh, you know, with, uh, with fishing groups, they have something called, uh, uh, like in my country, we have something called a beach management unit, whereby there are like 10, in every unit, they, we have like 10 or 11 fishermen. So they these are the, and they have an area where they they, they 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 fish. So they, it is their duty and it is their work to see that people use the right uh, the right fishing apparatus, the right fishing gear, and also maintain that this fishing area is safe for sustainable fisheries uh, uh, management in the, in the future. And then also we see another thing that or rather another measure that you can apply uh, is limiting the. Uh, the use of, uh, of of nitrogenous fertilizers and pesticides. We look for alternatives. We can see, um, uh, like the bot botanical gardens uh, in in my country, some 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 small scale farmers have, have uh, actually uh, been promoting the use of uh, of manure, uh, a safe manure, as uh, to their farms. And we see that this also lowers uh, the, the the rate at which the runoff. Of these uh, 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 of fertilizers are taken into the ocean because we know what happens in the terrestrial uh, ecosystem always will always affect the marine ecosystem. So we see also another uh, important factor is the attitude uh, that one can behold. You know, we can come up with we can have the best policies. You can go to school and become the best researcher, and 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 you know you can have the you can be the president or a king or something or a prime minister very in a very powerful position but if you don't have the right attitude to to conserve these uh, ecosystems or rather the because it's our duty to conserve this earth as a, as, as a whole i mean there's nothing much we can do and i usually say when i'm when i, when I usually tell my my students when i'm giving them a, a talk with regards to 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 to, to, to the environment environment versus business uh, supposed to be integrated but when the environmentalists decide to go alone and the business uh, uh, fraternity will go alone there's nothing much we can do because we need the business to survive and thus at the same time we need the environment to survive also we can also come up with uh, uh, different campaigns uh, like for example uh, the bsf is a very good platform uh, to campaign on uh, conservation measures of different uh, uh, ecosystems. And also, <clears throat> uh, we find that also uh, using, or uh, rather limiting or stopping the use of harmful fishing practices, which I had already mentioned up there. So I bet I will, I will skip that to save on time. Laws and policies, I had mentioned that also. We'll, uh, I had already explained the importance of coming up with laws and policies on, uh, on conservation of, of such uh, seagrasses. And then also encourage more research because uh, uh, seagrass uh, is, is one of the places whereby, yes, we have quite a number of people who have conducted research on the seagrass, but we have a lot that uh, can be done. So that is also a, a gap, a research gap that uh, can, be, can, be, can be advocated for. And then also minimizing of the runoff and then uh, and then also coming up uh, with reha uh, environmental rehab uh, rehabilitation practices whereby we see we have these miners coming in the area, they do their mining, but at the same time they employ the ecologists and the environmentalists to, 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 rehabilitate, uh, to rehabilitate the land and, or rather the, 
the ecosystem and we know that different areas require different techniques when it comes to environmental uh, rehabilitation. So I will go to the, uh, I hope uh, for the marine uh, fluorides has been clear that is found in the benthic ecosystem. So I will just, I will immediately jump to the benthic uh, fauna because that is where I measure on and that is where my research is based, uh, is based at. So, we see that uh, they are also found in the majority of this benthic fauna, or rather the endofauna, are found in the in the continental shelf. And this is because also the con we see that countries have the continental shelf. Um, um, other countries have a wide continental shelf, where, whereas others will have a very small continental shelf. But because of the good uh, lighting that is from the sun, with uh, the, the the right amount of temperature pressure we see that we have a lot of fauna that are concentrated on this uh, on this region and uh, and but that, that but that, that but that does not mean that a deep ocean does not have the end of fauna actually they also the, the deep ocean has a lot of uh, end of fauna is only that we we have it has not been exploited much um, that is why the the marine biologists will also say we always say we have exploited about Four percent of, uh, of of our ocean, so we have about ninety six percent, which is pretty lot for 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 conservation and uh, exploitation and just to know what is there. So we see the endofauna is uh, is divided into into two as I mentioned earlier. We have the epifauna, and the epifauna these are the uh, the fauna or rather the organisms that are living on the sediments. If I can just uh, give you a, a preview of it. All the organisms that live here on the seafloor of this, uh, of, of, of on the, the seafloor, they are called, or rather, they are referred as epifauna. An example is the sea slug. We have the crabs, we have the bivalves, we, we, quite, we have the lobsters, we have the sea urchins. We, quite a, we have quite a number of organisms that when you walk on the, on the beach or rather on the, on, the, on, the, on the continental shelf when there's a low tide, you'll always see them, the brittle stars and stuff like that. And then was at the same time, we have the sediment in uh, the in fauna. The in fauna, these are the, here, the ones that are living right under the seafloor, beneath the surface of, of the seafloor. And uh, we have the nematodes, we have the oligochates, we have the polychaetes and the rotifers, just as a few examples of, uh, of such organisms. So, we see, we also find uh, rather under the epifauna or under, and, 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 uh, and, and the infauna, we have, they are divided into several categories. We have the megafauna, we have the macrofauna, we have the meofauna, and uh, we have the microfauna. When you look at uh, the megafauna, we have the echinoderms as an example. Uh, the echinoderms will include the, the starfish, the sea cucumber. This is the this is the uh, uh, this is a sea urchin. I'm sure most of you have come across uh, across it, and specifically, it's usually concentrated in the seagrass because they are grazers. We have uh, we have these the lobsters. We have the sea cucumbers, and uh, one thing I, I like about the sea the sea, the sea cucumber is the unique characteristic that it possesses. Uh, once, once it is threatened by any anyone or anything, it eviscerates its internal organs so that uh, to deter the, the the enemy away. And then also we have uh, uh, the second uh, the second category of these uh, benthic fauna is uh, the macrofauna. The macrofauna will include the polychaetes, the amphipods, and uh, the, the the bivalves. So these are the the, the macrofauna. This is a polychaete, and then uh, uh, this is an amphipod, and these are the bivalves. And we know also the economic, the ecological, and economic importance that uh, these bivalves have right in, in in our lives. And basically, the before I forget, megafauna are are animals that are above five centimeters in size, whereas the macrofauna. Uh, vary in range of 500 micrometer to 5 centimeters. Anything within that range in size, we, re we consider it as a macrofauna. So we go to the male fauna, we have the oligochaetes. Uh, I mean, we have the oligochaetes, we have the nematodes, then we have the, the gnatostomes and others that uh, if you just look at the male fauna, it's a whole topic on its own also. 
you find you'll quite find you find you'll find quite a lot. So these sizes will 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 they also vary in size. That is, you will only get them from 63 micrometer to about a thousand micrometer. Others will say a thousand, depending on the seed that you have. It can be either be a thousand or 500. We go back here so that it they overlap. So with others will consider 500 micrometer, while others will do will consider a thousand. And also we have uh, this is just an example of. Uh, of an nematode, and uh, they are usually very unique uh, when you look at them under the, the, the dissecting microscope. And uh, this one is an oligochite, also it's very unique when you have a look at it uh, under the, the, the dissecting microscope, it's very unique. So you, you, will all, you will never confuse. So we go to the microfauna as the fourth and the last uh, uh, category of, uh, of this and the fauna. And we'd include the, also the rotifers and the ciliates. This is just an example of a ciliate. And it's important to note that uh, ju juveniles and of these, uh, these categories, they will tend to overlap. For example, you find, maybe, let's say if we consider the male fauna, you can find the male fauna as, at, or rather we know they are, I mean, nematodes are male fauna. So we expect them to strictly find them at the male fauna uh, uh, seed. But at the end of the day, when you look at it again, you, find, you can find it as a mic microfauna. That means this is just a juvenile. That is why we say the juvenile and adults, they will always overlap. And uh, at some point, again, you can find the seed, the seedlings. We know that they are microfauna, but are they, uh, when we do, so when, when you are doing, or rather when you're collecting your samples, you can see them as, male fauna. So it's important to note that also. So I will concentrate on uh, the male fauna uh, deeper because um, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, this is uh, where my study was or rather was based on. And, uh, and the majority of people, they know male fauna that are found in this benthic ecosystem as bioindicators. But I, this, with, during this research, I was just uh, I was just trying to show that I can use the nematode, which is a male, is 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 a genera in the nema, in the in the male fauna, that can be a better bioindicator of uh, of sediment disturbance. Not only sediment disturbance, but other other uh, 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 other uh, other factors like pollution and, uh, and 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 others. So we find that, uh, we see that the male fauna actually is a Greek word. Uh, that is derived from male and fauna, and then male meaning uh, 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 in Greek it means very small, and then the fauna, of course, automatically it's animals. So these are just very small animals, and you can see from from their sizes, it's they're actually very 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 small and very tedious to sample them. And then we see that they are they are found in in all uh, ecosystems. Uh, inside in either can be found in the saline ecosystem or the freshwater ecosystem in in the dam, as long as is just right below the water column. There is always that, which is uh, the, uh, the benthic ecosystem is, that is where always you can find these um, uh, fauna. So when you look at their, their ecological importance, uh, despite their small sizes, we see that a majority of these um, uh, fauna they actually play a very important role when it comes to the biogeochemical cycle example the the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle we see that for the case of the nitrogen cycle um nematodes play a key role when it comes to the the, the, the reduction of the nitrate into the nitrates and uh, there's a specific species of uh, of, uh, of of nematode that does this very well and also when you consider the the carbon cycle the carbon cycle we see that the microfauna play an important role uh, when it comes to the 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 the, uh, the, the this uh, to enable the carbon to be sequestered into the geosphere and also the remineralization uh, of uh, nutrients uh, back into the water column through the organic matter, and this also we see that it promotes a lot of uh, primary production. So that is just but an example of uh, the ecological importance of uh, these uh, uh, marine fauna. And also when we look at, uh, 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 at uh, another importance is that we see that they help in the interaction of the water column and the, and the benthic ecosystem, otherwise called the benthopelagic uh, uh, interaction, whereby uh, we, we see that they are mostly, they are either on top or, or, or 
inside the sediment. So that the ones that are inside the sediments, they 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 have their movements they, for feeding and also uh, also as they, they they look for their for their for their for their predators and also moving around also. So we see this this kind of uh, of movements. They really also helps in uh, in the in, in in the interaction of the water column and the benthic ecosystem. That is why you will find the benthic ecosystem is never dry. There is always water because of the water seepage and, and, the, and the capillarity action. And this meofauna plays an important role when it comes to this uh, this process. Also, we see that their food chain. Uh, they they actually uh, they play a key role when it comes to the food chain and the complex food webs in um, in, uh, in 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 uh, in the ecosystem. Yes, they are very small, but you find the commercial fish as an example. Uh, the flat fish they will always go into into the into the sediments to look for their for the for for these uh, small tiny 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 uh, fauna to feed on them. And we see that at the end of the day, we have. Uh, I mean, it will be able to. People, the fishermen will come in and they will do all, uh, all all their fishing. They will go sell, and at the end of the day, they have a better life uh, life lifestyle. Also, we have, see that the copepods also form a very in, they, they 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 form part. They form a, they, they 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 are very important when it comes comes to the food chain because the copepods will be fed on let's say a bigger fish, and then the bigger fish uh, will be fed by another thing, and then you know promoting the the the, the food chain and, and the complex food webs. So another important thing is that uh, they are they are bioindicators. We can see they are bioindicators for for sediment disturbance, pollution, accumulation of uh, contaminants, and then also in the assessment of uh, fish uh, farming of waste. When we when we say sediment disturbance, um, when there is a lot of sediment disturbance. Either the diversity of such male fauna will either increase or reduce. And also when you look at pollution, for example, oil pollution, you find that where there is an oil spillage or where there is an oil pollution, also when you look at the male fauna, you'll find there some male fauna will, uh, their diversity will increase while others will, will decrease. This is because mostly, uh, uh, because we find that Different, uh, different, different, different families in the male fauna are, have their ability to adapt and also tolerate such uh, such sediment disturbance and uh, pollution. So by you, by just by looking at it, you'll be able to know. Yes, uh, this there's there's um, there's a pollution of this kind or the sediment disturbance or maybe there's a uh, accumulation of such contaminants and that's why we term it as a bioindicator. And also uh, nutrients and uh, degradation of uh, the pollutants. <clears throat> so we see that um, for, for the case of the nutrients, carbon cycle, uh, this male fauna play an important role because of the carbon cycle and the organic matter, and also degradation of the pollutants. I will concentrate more on the degradation of the pollutants because uh, you find that uh, 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 organisms such as the nematodes, um, there's a specific family uh, uh, of, the of, of the nematodes, uh, they will once there's uh, there's an oil spillage, they will feed on these or, or such uh, long chain carbons, and by that you see it reduces or rather it helps in the degradation of of of, of, of such pollutants either uh, in in um, of such pollutants rather. So um, also when we see another 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 importance of uh, of marine uh, fauna is the cost effectiveness of using them. Um, a very good example is that when you want to do, let's say, uh, um, want to find out maybe there's a pollution of such, such certain, um, uh, let's say, contaminants. There are several, several contaminants have different, um, different methods on, on, on how we, we can detect their, their presence in such sediments. But you see, this setting, uh, these, 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 these experiments are pretty expensive, but by just looking at uh, some of these uh, male fauna, we only need to go to the field, collect them, and look at the diversity. Then, then at the end of the day, we will be able to know, and we'll be able to have to save a lot of money. So, let's look at uh, 
some of the major factors that affect these uh, marine uh, benthic uh, meofauna. Organic matter. Um, most of these uh, benthic meofauna will depend on organic matter uh, to, to, to feed on them, despite also the sea grasses. So we see that uh, when there is a lot of uh, decomposition of uh, organic matter, the, the distribution and diversity of meofauna, as mentioned earlier, will, will always be affected. And uh, once uh, they will either promote uh, the, uh, the diversity or rather will increase the diversity of this meofauna, and to some extent also it might reduce the diversity of, uh, of such meofauna. And we know organic matter will always de deprive uh, the oxygen concentration and, uh, and, uh, and this helps also in the accumulation of toxic byproducts such as the sulfates and, um, and the ammonia and forming an, a hypoxic uh, uh, um, a condition. And on a normal scale, these conditions, do, they don't support a, a variety of, um, of, 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 of organisms because of the, 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 the lack of oxygen rather. So organic matter is one of uh, the major factors that affect uh, benthic, uh, benthic fauna. And organic matter will either be caused by the release of uh, the nitrogenous fertilizers into into the into the, or rather the, the the water the, the water column which will seep in, and also uh, let's say a very good example. So another example is the availability of of, of the, the, the the flora that exists in uh, in the marine uh, ecosystem. Another another major factor that affects uh, uh, the marine benthic uh, fauna, we also have the ocean depth. We know for every ten uh, uh, for every ten meter we go deep, there's also there's an increase of uh, one uh, one atmosphere, and, uh, and 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 this will affect the body morphology of how you're going to uh, the body morphology generally the body morphology of such uh, meofauna. So you see that organisms that are found in the in the in the deep deep the deep ocean, you might find that these are uh, these they 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 are, they are small in size as compared to the organisms that are found in the continental in the continental shelf and also for the case of organic matter um in the in the continental shelf the these 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 readily available organic matter from from the terrestrial from the terrestrial uh, ecosystem as compared to the organic the availability of organic matter inside and rather in the deep ocean so you see that difference also creates a rather affect uh, the, the, the concentration and the diversity of uh, the benthic uh, meofauna. When you look at also the predator-prey interaction, just as I had, um, had, had mentioned on the sea grasses, when there's, there's an increase of predators, it means the, uh, the preys are the ones who are going to suffer. So and this, will pre will, this will create an ecological imbalance. It, this also applies in the meofauna as a whole. When there's a lot of, uh, when there's a lot of, the, of the predators, it means the preys will reduce. And when there is a lot of the and the, when the prey is reduced, it means also the predators will also re, in the long run will reduce because of starvation and uh, and this will create an ecological balance. When you look also at another another factor is the grain size. So when um, uh, the, we we find that um, uh, 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 the grain size will have, will also affect the body morphology of uh, of such organisms. We see that. Um, where these big, or rather the, the gravel and the sand sand conditions or sand sand gray, sandy gray, gray, uh, sandy grain sizes, we see that their body is usually slender, as compared to the, the to, to, to 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 organisms that are, or rather the mere fauna that are found in a muddy uh, muddy grain size condition. The slenderness actually is just to enable them to go through the the, 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 the the capillary or or rather the spaces or, that are created in the in the in the grain sizes whereas the ones that are muddy they they they, they are usually their body size is way much bigger so you see also this creates a, a, a difference in the in the body morphology other factors that will affect these are male fauna or rather the concentration will we have uh, fishing and when we talk about fishing just like the sea grasses we have uh, the the, the, the poor fishing uh, practices like using the, uh, uh, the trawlers. Also, we have construction of harbors. And also, this has been proven to affect the, the distribution and the diversity and abundance of, uh, of such organisms. 
and, uh, and not only the, concept, uh, the construction of harbors, but also we have, um, uh, through the past, we've been having people going into the ocean to, to look for the coral. And these coral are used for building uh, uh, the, the palatial homes and, uh, and, and the palatial hotels that, uh, that, that are found in the terrestrial world. So this one also has also been affecting their diversity of uh, such uh, uh, melfauna uh, uh, of such melfauna. Another another factor is the mining. Uh, mining we can, we can have deep sea mining, and and, uh, and the deep sea mining is we can concentrate maybe on on the nodules, the the mining of of, of the manganese nodules. We see that the microfauna play a very important role when it comes to the uh, when when it comes to the the, the production and the making of these uh, nodules. And uh, people or other humans will always go here to look for these, uh, for these nodules. And by doing that, we find that we, 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 we at the end, we, we, we kind of destabilize uh, the male fauna uh, uh, diversity in general. Also pollution, as seen in the sea crisis, we can have different kinds of pollution. We can have the plastic, we can have oil, we can have uh, 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 the, the, the release of, uh, of, of, of nitrogenous waste and others, and also the wave. Another factor is the wave action. So we see that um, in areas where there is no seagrass, um, the wave action actually is, is will be felt uh, way much stronger as compared to, 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 to where the uh, to the continental shelf where it where it's just uh, it's just bare, so we see that the wave action will be coming in and then carrying most of this fauna back into the deep the the the, the deep ocean and we see, we find that if they are not adapted to survive in the deep ocean at the end of the day because of the pressure and the temperature that are found in the deep oceans will also affect their 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 diversity and abundance at the, at the end of the day. Also, we have tourism and boating, tourism and boating rather. And um, um, there's there's a research that was conducted some time back uh, where they are consider they were looking at how tourism affects male, male, male fauna, and we see and they, the the findings was, was that where there is more of uh, tourism action happening, uh, the, the, the the diversity of such male fauna and the survival of such male fauna will, was uh, or rather was was rather low as compared to a pristine and uh, and an and undisturbed region. Also, we have uh, the agricultural runoff. The agricultural runoff, as usual, uh, just the same as the seagrass, it, 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 it also affects the male fauna. And you know, when the seagrasses are, are affected at the, at the end of the day, we also have uh, the, the, the benthic male, or rather the benthic fauna in general is also affected. Also, we have shipping. We see that uh, shipping, we, when it comes to shipping, we have the biofalling, uh, uh, the biofallers the, the bio rather. So they always they will always stick on the on the on the base of the ship where it is it is, it is inside the water, and this one has uh, several um, economic implications. And uh, by so doing, we find that most shipping companies have been applying an anti-falling agent. This anti-falling agent basically is tributylene, which is uh, pretty poisonous when it comes to the male fauna. And uh, several research have actually been done on the effects of anti-falling uh, agents on, uh, on, on, on such male fauna. And uh, if I can just uh, uh, recall, there was an interesting finding is that they were af these anti-falling agents were affecting the sex of, of, of such male fauna. So you find that we know we, we are so in, a, in, a, in a balanced ecosystem, we need to have the females and the males for, procre uh, for procreation purposes. But we see that the anti-falling agent could always favor the, 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 the birth of, uh, of the females. So we have trouble there. <clears throat> so just, uh, uh, just an overview, because I, uh, during my research, I was looking at um, uh, uh, male fauna as bioindicators. I just tried to explain what a bioindicator is. And uh, on, on simple, on a, or rather on a very simple uh, statement, is uh, just a living organism that ecologists and environmentalists can use to detect how healthy an ecosystem is when uh, such uh, organisms inhabit the area. So these are found either in uh, the terrestrial or the marine, uh, uh, the terrestrial, the, uh, the terrestrial ecosystem, the marine ecosystem, or the fresh uh, ecosystem. So we see, for the sake of the terrestrial ecosystem, um, we have things uh, we we we. 
we we have uh, bio indicators like the earthworms. When we go to the sediment soil and find earthworms, we know that that area is a, is, is pretty pristine. The marine ecosystem we as I've, I've mentioned we have the milk fauna and then, then the fresh uh, the fresh uh, ecosystem or rather the fresh water organisms also. We have the the water beetle that plays a key role when it comes to the quality or rather testing of the quality of, of the water. And uh, this is just an example of a, of a bio indicator. This is a this is a bit a, 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 a water beetle, whereas this is an earthworm. So throughout the the, the time, it was noted that uh, there was a lot of uh, fishermen were using polychaetes as uh, as uh, as bait for 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 fishing. And uh, and when you look at how these polychaetes are harvested, most likely is you, they. The, the, the fish focus or rather the fish the fishermen will always dig and churn the sediments of such areas and here we had three areas we had uh, one area that um, that that there was a lot of harvesting of such polychaetes so that is when we came and, uh, we came and asked ourselves so how is it affecting the 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 the, the, my, the, the, the fauna on a general scale in such areas so um, you see, this is such, such an example. This is how, these are the polychaetes, as you can see here. These are the polychaetes that are being harvested to be used as bait. Whereas this is how they do their, their harvesting of, of such, uh, of such polychaetes. So you see there's, there's a lot of uh, disruption and uh, there's a lot of digging and churning of the sediments. So from there, um, the, the sites, these were the sampling sites. It, uh, the sampling site was along the, uh, the Kenyan coast at Mida Creek, Kenya. And uh, the Mayonda area, this area, this area which is, uh, is called Mayonda, this is, was where most of, uh, of the harvesting of such polychaetes was happening. And then Kirepwe, they did not, uh, it's also a landing site and a basso where they did not have much of, uh, of, of such disruption. So that is why we took Mayonda, Irepwe, and Abaso being uh, uh, as, as our studies area. So yeah, um, it was done towards the, the subtitle zone. And uh, this, uh, uh, these transects are about 200 meters, uh, 200 meters long. And uh, after every 20 meters, we, 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 we had our quadrat of, uh, of one, time, uh, one by one uh, meter. So, that is that was how we, we were able to lay our transect, and uh, you will see that this area, or rather Kirepwe and uh, Dabaso, we uh, we were only able for for the case of Kirepwe, we we did up to only uh, transect D, whereas Dabaso went up to F. This is because of also the length of the of the of, 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 of the of, of the continental shelf, whereby I mean where we where uh, where the water. Uh, the water was reaching. So the, for, for Mayanda, it was quite long. And also this also promoted uh, the, 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 the harvesting of such polychaetes because polychaetes will always like places where there's a frequent coming in of the water and moving out. So this is just an explanation of how we, we, we collected. So in every quadrant we, we did, uh, we used a quora and uh, to, to collect uh, the, sediment, uh, the, the sediment samples. Most likely for for male fauna, we use uh, this tube cora, uh, whether in the deep sea or, uh, or, 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 or in the continental, uh, or rather where it is accessible in the intertidal zone. So when we collect, this is how it looks. Uh, when you dip in your cora, which is about, uh, this, uh, this is about 10 centimeters, it's recommended you go for, uh, in about 10 centimeters into the sediments, because that is why you'll be able to grab everything that, is, uh, that exists. So immediately you collect that, you fix it in a 4% uh, formal, formaldehyde, and then you transport it to the lab. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, and, and remember here, you'll be, we, we looked at uh, the sediment uh, grain size, we looked at the organic matter, and at the same time, we looked at uh, the organism. So it meant that we had, um, we had three samples of, of bees. We had three samples of bees. One for meant for to 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 work to look at the organic matter, the sediment sizes, and the the, the organisms themselves. So for the case of the sediment sizes, one we got to the lab and then we we dried them in the oven for uh, at seven at seventy degrees. This one I will not tell you 
how how long of the time span of which you're supposed to dry them because different uh, different uh, sediments have different components or other water water components so others will take really long others will take a really short time then after you dry them we try you don't crush them you just try to lose them to lose to loosen them gently because once you start crushing uh, these grains you see you're you're already affecting or rather you're tampering with them with the original uh, sediment grain size and also after that uh, after 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 you you gently uh, loosen them you put in the sieve we have a uh, sieve uh, mechanical shaker whereby different sizes of sieve uh, sieves dep uh, depending uh, that vary from uh, two millimeter to about uh, 65 uh, uh, micrometer and, uh, and 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 these are the and uh, these are the the, the sizes of the grains that will be collected from uh, from the shaker because the shaker always uh, will have different sieve sizes. That is, for example, like the hub, the hub and the scientific sieve. That is also what what you use. It can start from two millimeters, or it can it can start from uh, five millimeter, depending on what you really want. So after that, uh, we you we you take the proportion of the sediments and then uh, you you weigh them and uh, also calculate. The percentage of uh, the total samples weight uh, in, uh, in in proportion. So when you go to the organic matter, organic matter we want to find out. Uh, we uh, for, we want just want to find out what what the the content of the organic matter. So we also dry it in the oven, and uh, then after you dry, this is when you weigh. After you weigh. You, you record the, the, the initial weight and then you ash it to about uh, 600 degrees Celsius using a muffled furnace for six hours. Six you are sure by, by Yes. You are sure by you doing that, you'll be able to, 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 to get or rather to, to, to ash all the sediment organic matter. And then you calculate the diff, uh, you rather you will, you'll take the difference before ashing and after ashing and then after uh, you you will calculate the proportion of the organic matter from there, and uh, you, it's it's just uh, obvious that um, where there is more organic matter, we we co according to our samples, we expect to find more of uh, of the male fauna. And also, uh, just to mention on the grain sizes, grain sizes we find that the the, the, the grain sizes that is this, the 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 this, the, little, the tiniest, which are also uh, we can refer to them as mud. This is whereby we find a lot of, um, uh, uh, or rather, affects the distribution or the diversity of, uh, of organisms that you will calculate. You, you find that for the case of the 0 0.063 millimeters or, six, uh, or 63 micrometer, this is where most of the, uh, the nematodes concentrate at, as compared to other sizes or grain sizes. So. Uh, in the laboratory, also, uh, we want to analyze or rather to 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 to, to, to remove our male fauna from these uh, from these uh, samples. So what we need to do for if is first to rinse them over the sieve. That is the Hubbard scientific sieve. This is how they are. You see, like um, this. The, 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 this is the two millimeter or the five millimeter, depending. This comes to the top because. It will help us to to, to grasp the the the, 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 the macro uh, or rather the mega fauna, uh, whereas these other ones will help. Uh, the second one will help us to, to to grab or rather to catch to get hold of the mega fauna and then the male fauna and then the micro fauna seed that comes uh, at the end, which which should be this one. So after that, we will we'll add uh, once you we have rinsed all all our samples, we take the one that we need. We need the male fauna. So this one, we know, we take the seed that that is uh, is sixty three micrometer. So you we add a magnesium a magnesium sulfate, and this magnesium sulfate is, a, is at a specific density of one point two eight, uh, because this this is the density at which uh, male fauna will be segregated from from the from the from the from the soil sediment or rather the sediments. So we centrifuge it. Uh, we after we add them the, the the magnesium sulfate. Uh, we centrifuge it at 6,000 RPM because this is the, the RPM that uh, that also will separate this male fauna from uh, from, uh, from from the sediment. And we'll do this for about 10 minutes, and then we can't. 
after you decant because when you decant uh, uh, when, when when you centrifuge the male fauna will actually settle on top of, of your of your centrifuge your centrifugation bottle so we decant after we decant in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a separate bottle we can add a, a formaldehyde solution and rose bengal just to improve on their quality on what you see and then after uh, after we have done all that remember you should sieve your your, I mean, you should rinse your sieve because magnesium sulfate is very notorious uh, for for blocking such uh, such sieves. So um, once you have your 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 superdant, it's called super superdant. You'll be able to pick the different or to pick, identify, and also enumerate the different male fauna that are there. So for example, and uh, there's a book that is called Introduction to the Study of Male Fauna by Robert P. Higgins. It's, it's very good when it comes to identification of, of such male fauna. It's actually one of the key that is used uh, by, by most uh, scientists to identify marine uh, male fauna. So once you do that, you, because uh, you're more interested with the nematodes, you, as you identify, you pick the nematodes and put them in a separate jar, whereby also you, you, you process them after processing, you mount them on slides, and then also there's another key by Platt and Warwick that will be used to identify such uh, such nematodes. And um, uh, this is just an but an example. This is just but an example of some of the features that um, that we look at when we identify such uh, such nematodes generally. So you find that, for example, this one here, you see it has something here that that protrudes. That is the tooth. Uh, that means that this one is a uh, it, or rather it's a predator, same as this one. Whereas you'll find uh, other nematodes that look like this. These mostly they, are, they, are, they, they feed on organic matter and, uh, and, and, uh, and stuff like that. And then when you, have, when you get some, some, some nematodes that resemble, that have a, a buccal cavity that looks like this, it means that mostly it depends on diatoms or rather feeds on on diatoms. Actually, when you look at the, the identification key by Platt and Warwick cards, it is explained very well. So it will be really of, of help. So let us look at our results. Um, we, fi we find that in Mayonda, as I had mentioned earlier, that was where there was much of, uh, of, of sediment disturbance, or rather the harvesting of these uh, polychaetes to be used as, uh, as bait. And we find that, uh, or rather, our results indicated that Mayonda had actually the least organic matter, as compared to the Baso and Kirepo. And also, this one, or because we uh, we didn't do research on it, but by just by looking, we found that also organ uh, uh, for the case of Mayonda, despite having a lot of sediment disturbance, the the incurling or rather the organic matter also uh, was was rather low, which can be attributed for the forest cover, that is the mangrove forest. There was no much of uh, of mangrove forest as compared to Dabaso and uh, and and Kirepo. When you look at um, at uh, the grain size, for the case of Mayonda, we see that there is a one. The organic matter was very low. We see silt also was very low. Uh, also, very fine sand was very low. And uh, these two, the silt, the very fine sand, will always affect the distribution of of, uh, of nematodes as compared to other male fauna. Uh, male fauna taxa. So that will, that will also have that in mind because it will it will try to exp to explain our findings of, of the nematodes that we we got at the end of of, of, of the of the of, of the research. So when we look at uh, the male fauna and uh, and the nematode density, this is the nematode density. We see that um, this is other male male fauna, whereas this is the nematode. So we see that the, 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 the nematode at, uh, at Mayonda, where there was a lot of, um, of, of, of sediment or other polychaetes uh, being harvested, uh, we, we saw it came in second and um, as compared to Kirepo. But this is subject to, or rather further research so that we can understand this, uh, this phenomena. But we expected that the nematode density would be in Mayonda would be, would be quite low as compared to that of, uh, of Kirepo. When you look at, um, at the relative abundance, uh, the relative abundance for uh, 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 for this uh, uh, male fauna vis-a-vis the nematodes is that um, Mayonda also, the relative abundance, when you look at the relative abundance, 
the 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 the, the Mayonda for the nematodes that uh, at Mayonda actually was at 59 as compared to Kirepo. We expected that uh, it should be vice versa, whereby Mayonda had the least, whereas uh, Kirepo was second. But also that one is a is a research gap that we we'll do further research to to find uh, to rather explain these findings. When you look at the distribution of uh, these nematodes after identification, we see that uh, there's Spirinia tachelingia, uh, which cut across all the station. And this is because these two uh, genera of, uh, of nematodes, they depend on diatoms, if not organic matter, to, to, to feed on, uh, on them. So we see that where there was a lot of sediment disturbance, which, for example, is the QE, QF, QG, because um, this, is, this is where most of, uh, uh, of, of harvesting was being done. We see their concentration also really reduced, and uh, this can be a, 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 an indication to show that um, that quite uh, sediment disturbance actually affects uh, affects uh, the, the distribution and the diversity of such uh, such nematodes, and that is why we say that they can be good uh, bioindicators of uh, sediment disturbance. At the same time, when you look at Feronas, it was absent in all other all other stations but when we come to 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 my where there was a lot of sediment uh, uh, sediment disturbance or rather the, the harvesting of the polychaetes we see that their, their 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 distribution increased and the foreigners most of the time are 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 are, are, are nematode genera that are uh, either predators or scavengers so that means during this, uh, if we can interpret this data, it means that during the, the harvesting of such polychaetes, there was a lot of uh, male fauna that was being lost. And that is why it pushed such uh, general, such as the feronas to, to come in. Same applies to this viscosia. Viscosia and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and feronas are in the same, uh, they actually, their feeding habit is actually uh, the same together with Pontonema. That is why we find that most of the scavengers and uh, the predators were found in the Mayonda. Uh, as you, as you also saw, we also saw, the organic matter was was really low. So, um, when you look at the diversity, uh, the Mayonda, uh, I mean the Meofauna versus the nematodes, we see where there was a lot of disturbance of uh, of, uh, of of of. of well, there was a lot of rather polychaetes harvesting or rather sediment disturbance. The diversity was very low, which is very true. Um, 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 there's the organic water being lost. There's the sediment sizes that were was being affected, and you, and we know silt most of the time is being is carried away by the wave action. So when there's a lot of disturbance, the this, the little silt that is there is carried away. This affects the the uh, the, 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 the the proportion that can be found uh, that that will be found in, in such areas. So, and this also in turn affected the, the diversity of such. Now, this one is the male fauna. In my honor, we see that other, other male fauna uh, uh, taxas increased. This is because there was an increase of the other, uh, other grains, that is the sandy grains and the gravels, which favors the, 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 uh, the, the which, or rather, which favors the, what we call it, what, what can I term it? It, fo it favors, the other male fauna taxas to come up as opposed to uh, to the uh, to the to the nematodes, and then these nematodes uh, diversity actually was rather high. This was because as most of the churning was being done, we see that the feronas and uh, the likes of feronas and viscosia, which are predatory, they come in. These are the ones that actually helped to push uh, to push this diversity up as compared to other areas where there was no disturbance and where the organic matter was was intact so well, when you look at uh, the communities that that is when we we, we did further analysis on the tie on the primer we used the primer uh we find that for the case of the community here in every these quadrants were well I can say they were well mixed when it comes to on the on the on the on the on the, on the, type, on the side of uh, similarity. This is the male fauna in general. When you look at the male fauna in general, you we see that all quadrats had and had quite the similarity for this male fauna was quite similar. And when we go to nematodes, we see that uh, in the primer it actually segregates the quadrats further. 
we see that the Dabaso and the Kirepwe uh, uh, nematode community, they were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were put together. Kirepwe here was put together because of the similarities that they had together. And then also Mayonda was left out. And when you look at Mayonda, uh, you see that here, the Dabaso and Kirepwe, they kinda, they kinda integrate. So it means their similarity was quite similar as opposed to when you look at Mayonda where there was more of polychaetes harvesting so this this clearly tells us that the nematodes can be a better bioindicator as compared to to male fauna and we can use also the nematodes in the terrestrial ecosystem whereby we can also find out is how 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 healthy is uh, is that uh, is that ecosystem so conclusion um we see that harvesting of polychaetes actually or rather polychaetes as baits affects the distribution diversity and community assemblage of both male fauna and uh, nematode which is which is very true and also based on the on this research it was evident that the nematodes are good bioindicators of sediment disturbance so instead of 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 of, of going to look for 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 research tools and everything we just have to go and maybe collect the nematodes and uh, We'll be able to know if the area is uh, is 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 healthy or or not, and also it is. It was this was made uh, rather this was made possible by looking at the distribution, diversity, and the community assemblage of uh, such nematodes. And also, just in conc in conclusion, also uh, we see that uh, the genera that is the marine uh, the marine nematode uh, uh, such as the Tachylinia and the Spirinia, Viscosia pontonema, Sinochium and uh, Feronas have very good when it as uh, they, they can be very good when you, look, when you try to consider nematodes as bio indicators also it is important to note that um uh one region which had no much of uh, of, of 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 harvesting of this of such polychaetes we see the kirepwe it has actually the least nematode density and i can say as i as i said this is uh this is as a research gap whereby we'll need to look further uh, to find out as to why so let's see how we can now uh, we can manage or rather mitigation measures we can manage or rather we can uh, discourage uh, uh, these fish focus from going or rather using polychaetes as uh, as baits we can always look for alternative fishing baits and uh, this is and by giving them alternative fish uh, fishing uh, fishing baits it will help us to preserve the marine, uh, or rather the benthic ecosystem further, because we have seen the effect it does through the nematodes, the effect it does to the other groups of, of the benthic uh, ecosystem. And this can be implemented through, as I mentioned earlier, the beach management units, whereby these units are, you, or rather the uh, NGOs, the government, or people, the stakeholders can give them alternative baits and it can be distributed to other fishermen. And also in filling of such holes that are being um, uh, that are that are being used as a, as a harvesting areas, we know that uh, the male fauna actually are very good when it comes to to, to colonizing an area. And by by just in filling such holes, we see that uh, we improve the bait stocks and also the, the, will be the habitat improvement. And also we'll re we'll reduce the disturbance of non-targeted species. So you you can imagine we are going to look for polychaetes, but let's say we have a ghost crab around, though sometimes it's very difficult to get a hold of a ghost crab. Let's look let's look for a better example, a bivalve. So you can see how the effect it can it can do to to this bivalve. And also monitoring of such fish stocks uh, to see uh, that they minimize on on, uh, on bait harvesting. And uh, this is through the policies, the laws, or, or whatever uh, we can come up with so that we see that how they, they, they do their, their harvesting is in a controlled way or something. It can be either be rotational or, or, or one of the sort. And also, we can also advocate for for, for bait uh, farming, this is done either um, uh, you, 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 where, whereby you, 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 you advise people, or rather you, com you campaign or you advocate for people to come up with uh, bait uh, farming. And this one will also ease up pressure on the, the wild stock. And then also uh, to rush to, to ration, rush, uh, being or rather on a rational basis uh, or 
or you ration the number of people that come into, if at all they have to do the, the harvesting, we can always ration them on how, on, on this, we can ration these fish focus on how they come in, how they, 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 they they, they, they harvest where they are supposed to harvest this season, maybe next season. So it might become more of a rotational practice. And uh, with that, I will say uh, thank you for, for listening to me. Though I've taken, uh, I've taken quite a bit of time, but thank you so much.